to our online worshipers. We thank you for joining us on tonight for Bible study. Our scripture will come from Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4. And it says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. That's Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4. Our song is, I sing praises to your name. Sing praises to your name. chapter 2 verse number 13 is where we are tonight Philippians chapter 2 verse number 13 Philippians chapter 2 verse number 13 
We're in the Experiencing God book, page 38. Experiencing God, page number 38 is where we are tonight. And we are looking at the fact that God takes the initiative. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says this. It is God who is working in you, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. It is God who is working in you. God is working in us. If we're saved, if we're born again, we have the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, in us. He, God the Holy Spirit, is working in us. It is God the Holy Spirit, it is God himself working in us, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So God is working in us. He's constantly working in us. He's always working in us. And as he is working in us, he is reaching out for some goals. Number one, number one, to will and to work according to his good purpose. So we want to always focus on God's will and God's purpose. As we move through this life, God is working through us. The topic here says God takes the initiative. God's revelation of his activity is an invitation for you to join him. God's revelation, as God reveals things to us, whether he does it through scripture, through prayer, or through circumstances, God is giving us revelation through his word. He's giving us revelation through circumstances and he's given us revelation through our prayer life. God's revelation of his activity is an invitation for you to join him. God gives us revelation, and that revelation is an invitation in which we ought to join him. So we have chosen some readers for, for the paragraphs ahead. So uh, Brother Whitlock is going to take the first two. Sister Whitlock got the second two. Sister Cord Woods has the, the top of page 39 and number one. And Sister Davis will close us out where it says God is always, God always takes the initiative. Microphone, please. God is taking the initiative. And this initiative that he's taking, he is taking it to re reveal things to us. Yes? Starting with the first paragraph. I was working at my office one day when I received a letter from a woman who told me about an expectant mother who was attending an Experiencing God class until she suffered a miscarriage. She was devastated and quit attending the study as well as the church services. The woman writing the letter included the young woman's phone number. I sensed it was God's invitation. I called the woman. I told her that God still loved her. We prayed and went together. I learned later that she rejoined the group and her church. God blessed her with several more children and led, and led her to begin a ministry in her church for women who suffered the loss of children. I have learned that as God's servant, I must always be ready for my next assignment. Throughout scripture, God takes the initiative. When he, comes, when he comes to people, he reveals himself and his activity. That revelation is always an invitation for people to adjust their lives to God. None of the people God encountered would remain the same afterward. They had to make major adjustments in their lives to walk obediently with him. Amen. So let's look at what happens here. There's a woman who's taken the experience God by experiencing God's Bible study, just as we are. 
a friend of hers, a lady knows that she has had a miscarriage. A miscarriage is devastating. A miscarriage is traumatic. Because couples all over the world look forward to babies and they look forward to doing things and um, making sure that they do everything that will make that baby safe when it gets here. But she has a miscarriage. A woman who writes a letter to the pastor on her behalf and he says that, that he called her. As he called her, he discusses with her the fact that God still loves you. Why was that necessary? Why was it necessary for him to remind her that God loves you? Or was it necessary? Yes. Why was it necessary? Because she probably lost all faith in God. Because she lost faith in God? Could have. Could have. Say it again. Okay. Right, we're, we're like the Pharisees sometimes. We think that when things go wrong, God is punishing us for some sin we've committed. Is that always the case? I think it's John chapter 9 where there's a blind man. He was born blind. The Pharisees want to know, the religious people, the people of the law wanted to know who sinned, him or his folk? <laughs> Jesus says, neither one of them sinned. But then Jesus goes on to say, not only did they not sin, not only did he not sin, not only did no one sin, but this was done so God will be glorified. I told you earlier that God blesses us and reveals things to us through our circumstances through our situations. So we have to know that God initiates things so he can speak to us. That's right. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So God speaks to us through our circumstances. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us in the midst of prayer. God is always talking to us. God is always initiating stuff. God is always at work around us. Now, in this woman's case, was it a good thing? <laughs> yes, no. It was devastating. And when we look at it, we feel just like that woman, even though we can't feel what she felt. We all agree in this room, online, we all agree that this was devastating. Yes. This was heart wrenching. This was a bad deal. Mm -hmm. You talking about a bad day at the office, a bad day at the house, a bad day at the hospital. Mm -hmm. This was tough. Yes. Whether she was Christian or not, God uses these circumstances mm -hmm. to get our attention. Mm -hmm. What circumstances have you had mm -hmm. that God used? You know. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> You you can get the mic if you get the mic. Share, share with us, please. Share share with us if there are any circumstances in your life. And everybody get a chance. Are there any circumstances in your life that God at least tried to get your attention? He even tried. You know, check this out. Sometimes God initiates situations and He attempts to get our attention. It falls on deaf ears and deaf eyes. You ready? Yeah. Tell us your circumstances. Oh, uh, God got my. You only have one. I have several. Okay. I yes. had one just this week. <laughs> God gets. Uh, he got my attention when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Okay, that was one incident. How did we get your attention? I mean, why would breast cancer get your attention? Oh, that'd get anybody's. Attention. Why would God be the one trying to get your attention? <laughs> I guess I was not listening. Oh, you were listening? <laughs> you were saying it? I guess so. Oh, okay. So so now we're back to God only gets our attention through sin? Well, he wanted, he had another work for me to do. Okay, he had another work. Did he have to do that to get your attention? I guess so, because I wasn't listening. <laughs> so you think God brought cancer upon you so you can listen? Uh -huh. Did it make a difference? Now you listen. 
sometimes. I see. So now, God, my, 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 I tell you, we're going to have to discuss this tonight. But what you're telling me is you believe that God allowed a circumstance, namely breast cancer, to come upon your body. God allowed it to get your attention. And now you're saying he got your attention for a moment. Okay, let's, let's talk about it. He, he, he got my attention, and uh, you know, and I guess he wanted to move me to another level. Oh, okay. Did you did. move to another level? Yes, I think I did. Can you tell when you went from one level to the other? Yes, I can, because I used to be really, really shy. Really shy? And I wasn't going to be talking if I didn't have to. Oh, really? Now we can't shut you up? No, nah, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so you telling me that sometimes God will allow things to happen in our daily walk with him where he can get our attention when he's been trying to get our attention all along. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in your case, breast cancer. Okay. So you said that you were shy. You said now you talk. And now you, I guess you said you speak up for God. I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> Okay. Anything else? Did in this whole do you think that God could have gotten your attention without that? Yes. He could have. Well, how come he did? I don't know why he didn't. You do know he's God. Yes. God uses circumstances to get our attention. So you say he after he did this, he got your attention sometime. Or every now and So tell us about that. This is disgusting, right? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to, you know, do what God wants me to do and what I feel as if he's called me to do. And sometimes may, I might be a little bit overboard because I might be, you know, not acting in his will. So in other words, even though God uses circumstances to get our attention, sometimes we take, take it farther than God wants us to go mm -hmm. or sometimes we get ahead of God. All of the above. Okay, I see. So, in order to avoid that, what do we have to do? Constantly pray and seek His will, and read. Constantly pray and seek His, his will. Word. Do things according to His purpose. Study His word. Pray with Him. Constantly. Uh, the, the next part of this passage that we want this book that we won't get to tonight is talking about learning to walk with God. We have to learn to walk with God. We don't grow up. We don't. We're not born. We don't grow up day to day walking with God. Agree? Yeah. Now, you don't have to teach a child how to cuss. <laughs> Why do we have to teach them how to walk with God? Everybody agree you don't have to teach a child how to curse? You don't have to teach a child how to steal? You don't have to teach a child how to lie? Because this is sin nature. And in the midst of sin nature, then we learn all these things that the devil wants to do. Mm -hmm. But you have to be intentional in teaching children the word of God. Moses says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, write it on the doorpost. Mm -hmm. Write it on the, on the exit room. Write it on the, the bedroom. Write it on the forehead of their brow. Teach it to them when you get up in the morning. Teach it to them while they're lying down. Teach it to them as you are reading bedtime stories. You have to make sure that some of those bedtime stories ought to be from the Bible. Our bedtime stories ought not be fairy tales. Our bedtime stories ought to be teaching our children the word of God. We ought to teach them how to pray. We don't have to teach them how to fuss, but we got to teach them how to pray. That's right. So circumstances, circumstances arise in our lives where God is trying to get our attention. This woman had a miscarriage. She was devastated. Do you think she was the only one that was devastated? No. Who else was devastated? Family members. Family members, husband, her inner circle. Her neighbors. It says to us that when God allows circumstances to come in our lives, 
we become a walking billboard of what's right or what's wrong. Now, Sister Davies had had cancer and nothing changed. <laughs> Would God have gotten her attention? Does God want everybody to speak up for him? Yes. yes. Why? Does every Christian speak up for God? No. Why not? Anybody, anybody. Yeah. Why people don't speak up for God? Afraid, fear, afraid fear. of rejection. Rejection. Well, it, well, in this particular case, um, I, it's sometimes it's pain. Pain. They don't speak up because of. of of the pain that they have felt, so they they tend to go quiet. So it doesn't discuss whether she was normally quiet, right? Mm -hmm. But you're right. Sometimes things are so painful mm -hmm. until we cannot speak up. Maybe we're not pure, not not uh, mature enough to speak up at the time. Maybe we've been so devastated that we can't think about anything but what we're going through. I'm going to tell you, sometimes even the strongest of Christians can get to a point where he or she can't even pray. Have you been there? Yeah. Have you ever been to a point where your life was on the rocks so terribly until you couldn't even ask God to have mercy? My babysitter growing up, Mary Lee Clark, would tell us right before we would go to bed, she would be reading to us. She was a teenage girl, but she loved the Lord. And she would say to us, before you move into your sleep, make sure you say, Lord, have mercy. She said, because it may be something that you have done that you can't even think of. You have to make sure you have mercy from the Lord. The book of Job confirms that. The book of Job says that Job's children were gathering together and, and, and Job prayed for them on a regular basis. And it says the reason why Job prayed for them is because Job knew or Job thought maybe, just maybe, some of them have sinned today. So God moves. God initiate things. God takes the initiative in the midst of our circumstances. We're on page 38 at the bottom of the page, day three. This woman was expected. Do you think she was expected with great joy? Oh, yeah. of course. Today, the news reporter says five children have been left unattended and thrown away in the city of Houston in the last month. Five children, and, and when I say thrown away, I mean literally thrown in the dumpster, mm -hmm. left on the side of the road, left unattended. Five children already in one month. Matter of fact, two weeks. One lady has a baby in the back of a, a food truck, gets out of the food truck, take the baby, throw them in the near dock, the dumpster. Five babies like that. And I pray that those babies found homes that will make a difference in their lives. Yeah. Pastor Alan Grimes at the, at the um, Pastor Alan Grimes and Sister Deborah Grimes were former mem members of, of the Holy Street Church. One of the babies that were found in the dumpster, they adopted that child from a newborn. Now he's, he's getting ready to graduate from college. And he's had a good life. Mm -hmm. Whether he wants to meet his biological family or not, that's up to him. Mm -hmm. But he's had a good life. Mm -hmm. Good parents. Mm -hmm. People with children, some folks don't need to have any babies. Five children already. Two weeks. Either left on the side of the road, left in the dumpster, just left unattended. And we have procedures in place where you can leave babies and don't even have to worry about being arrested. 
fire department, hospital, police department, or somebody else. And you don't even have to worry about being arrested, but they dump children off. Here is this woman, want a baby, and she has a miscarriage. She's devastated. She drops out of Bible study. She drops out of church. Let me just be the first one to say, when you're hurting, you don't know what to do. When circumstances come, you just don't know what to do. You don't know who to tell. You don't know where to go. And you don't know who to trust. Circumstances will put us in a bad situation. The woman that was writing the letter says that this young woman's phone number is this. The pastor calls her. He's, he's very sensitive to the fact that God is putting out an invitation to her. Let me tell you, God is laying out an invitation. Sister Wanda Moten says we must, we must stay humble. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we are God-centered and not self-centered. Mm -hmm. This was enough for this woman to be self-centered, it was enough for her to just throw up her hands and say, forget it. But she got back to being God-centered. Look at the results. He called the woman, told her that God still, still loves her, and um, she began to rejoin the group, and she began to go back to church. We've lost so many people over circumstances and many of those people are making commitments of no longer going to church and they don't really know the facts. Mm -hmm. I remember we were, we were in the storefront and a lady told me before church started, and that's when we were packed in Johnson & Johnson. We were packed in there. And so 80 people on a Sunday went and we were just packing people in there. And the lady told me before church started, my son is not here, he's sick. My response, we are praying for him, and uh, I'm glad you did. He was a little boy, maybe 10. So it was youth Sunday, so I called all the youth up, and I prayed for each youth one by one, and guess what I did? Okay. I forgot to pray for her son. Brother Johnson, I was praying for every youth that was there, and I forgot to pray for her son. That woman stormed out, and before she stormed out, she wanted the whole church to know, I'm done with this church. He ought to know. He knows who I am. He knows how I think. I'm done. Mm. And that's the last time we saw him. Mm. Just so I can get it straight to, to the group that's still here, I'm not a robot. Mm. I'm not a computer. And now that I'm almost 20 years older than I was that day, mm -hmm. I don't remember things Amen. like I used to. Amen. And even though I may remember something, if something else happened, I may get it caught up in the thickets. Mm -hmm. That's why people said, blame it on my head, not to my heart. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell y'all a secret. Sometimes I go upstairs and forget what I went upstairs to get. Literally 15 steps. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in the house <laughs> can justify? I, I Sometimes I don't have to go upstairs. Sometimes I don't have to go downstairs. I can go around the corner, mm -hmm. Brother Miles. <laughs> and guess what I have to do? I go back in the room where I started. That's right. And I looked over the room where I started. Mm -hmm. And then I said, oh, that's what, that's it's something, something. Jump, jump started again. I mean, I, I have to connect to the booster cables. Mm -hmm. You're right. Something will yeah, jump start right. my mind, and I will go back in that room, and when it jump jump start my mind, then I say, oh, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to prepare to forget. You ever prepare to forget? Let me tell you how I prepare. I, I said, go and get my keys, and I walk all the way up the stairs, go and get my keys. Go and get my keys. I'm talking to myself. Go and get my keys. Go and Anybody else like that? <laughs> You're not by yourself. 
I mean, we have to get to a point where we're realistic. And then don't let some, some tragedy happen to some member. And I'm thinking about that member. And I forget to call your name or what you did in the church. It's not something that I just mean to do. I just, not a robot, not a computer. God doesn't download or upload some chip in me every morning. I got stuff in my head that folk told me don't tell anybody. They ain't got to worry about me not telling anybody. <laughs> it's a gone. You know why, Sister so, so Willow? It's gone. <laughs> I can't let your stuff roll around in my head. I forget what I'm trying to do. <coughs> God allows us to go to, through situations. But when we go through situations, the author says that this is, we ought to be able to sense the fact that God is giving us an invitation to join him when he's at work. Amen. And as God gives us this invitation through situation, we need to understand that we need to deal with it from a God-centered perspective, not a human initiative or self-centered right. perspective. The, the pastor said we prayed and we wept together. I have wept with so many people in the last 30 some years. Mm. And I go on and forget about it and every now and then I get a phone call. Mm. Well, you remember when? No, I'll remind mm -hmm. you. remember when and then they, they, they stick the booster cable to me? Yeah, I got it now. Mm. Now now that you reminded me, I can tell you word for word where we are, mm. what, what we did, what we said. 15-year-old boy dad passed away and we had what was known as the men of Christian model. So we were, I was maybe 27, he was 15, his daddy died. And after he got to be about 17, he started doing crazy stuff. His mama called me over to the house one night, said, hey, this boy got a bag in my, in, in his room. And I, I went in there and he didn't have a bag. You know when they had the big brown grocery bag when they were free? He had about eight grocery bags. And she said, she said, it, it just looked like when I asked him about it, he said, it's just cigars. But you know, I've been around the block more than once. So I would put my I put my hand in the bottom of one bag and lifted it up. And she said, Well, what is that? And I said, that's enough drugs to put everybody in the house in prison. So he, he she said, Well, he's gonna be at home at nine o'clock. He's not gonna stay out. After nine o'clock. So, so I said, well, let me move my car because if he sees my car, he's not going to come in. She hit the garage. The garage went up and I saw feet standing outside of the garage. He saw my car, so he was going to come through the garage and get to his bedroom. But I was going out the garage to move my car. And when he saw my face, he said some things that I couldn't repeat. He was like, <clears throat> he's here. And he knew why I was there, because I was his mentor. Mm -hmm. So we had to take a ride, and when we took a ride, Sister Woods, I did some things I couldn't do at the church. <laughs> I said some things that I couldn't say at the church. Mm -hmm. And I threatened him, and I said this. And so later on, fast forward some 25 years later, I get an unfamiliar call, and this time I, I answer the call. He gives me his name. I recognize his voice. And he says to me, thank you. He said, man, I'm, I'm practicing now and I'm in school to be a minister. And I just want to tell you what you did for me and no one else did made a difference. Now I'm on the phone crying. Uh, he's on the phone crying. We both like two babies. I mean, we just bawling. I can hear him, <laughs> and I can, and he can hear me. And that's what makes ministry worthwhile. And that's what God does in the midst of adverse situations. God is able to give us a blessing in the middle of it. That's what He does for this woman on on page thirty eight. That's what He does. She goes on. And she has several more children. And she takes on a ministry. 
in this ministry are this ministry is dedicated to women who have lost children. Let me just say what you say to you. God has you in a situation right now so you can minister to those who are in that situation or will be in that situation. You didn't just go through it just so you could be hurt. You didn't just go through it so, so you, can, you can get upset with God. We must be ready for our next assignment. And the only way to be ready for our next assignment is to not take it personally. That's right. That's right. You know you haven't done anything to God. You know you're not caught in sin all the time. You, you, know, you sin, you just confess your sin. And you know that nobody can claim that you are this way because of your sin. God is calling you. He's tugging at your heart to use these consequences, these circumstances, these situations, he wants you to use every situation you're going through to bless somebody else like this woman did. Amen. She knew it was her assignment. Mm -hmm. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. What does that tell you? What does that, just that title say? Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. What does that mean? What kind of mothers are those? Their children, right? So these mothers have a calling. Some of them are not Christians, but they have a calling to make sure that those drunk drivers don't kill anybody else's child. Winos and well, past winos, past alcoholics. They make the best counselors for substance abuse because they know what you're feeling. They know what you're going through. And they can talk you through it. Matter of fact, they can tell you what you're going to go through before you go through it. That's why Paul says, it was good that I was afflicted. So what is God preparing you for? Turning hearts ministry would not exist if I had not been born with a heart condition. It would not be in existence. It's because September 5th, 1995, they rolled me into the hospital to have open heart surgery. While I was laying there, the man, the doctor, Dr. Grinstead, comes to me and he says, we're going to cancel the surgery and I don't see a reason for you to ever have surgery. And as I laid on that table, the spirit of the Lord said to me, whatever problem you can have in your physical heart, you can have that same problem in your spiritual heart. And thus now we have turning our ministers. And it's because I was afflicted. It was because I had circumstances where I had to go to the hospital every single year, driving from the Mississippi Daddy Drove, from the Mississippi Delta all the way to Jackson, some 90 miles every year. Every single year. Every year. Got prepared for it. I'll tell you another circumstance I had. Mama, you know, some of y'all didn't live in the country, so you can't identify. We we had we had a yard that we swept with a broom. And then after we swept the yard with the broom, we were blessed and highly favored, if that's such a thing. We were tremendously blessed because we had a car porch. Other people had a rock. A, a, layer, a, a level of rock for their car. We had a car for it. And mama said, and you know, mother's intuition, she had not seen us sliding. We washed the porch down. I'm about eight years old. We washed the porch down. And mama hollered from the inside of the house. And she said, do not slide on that porch. Well, we were already sliding. My friends were there. And these were my words. I got to get in one more. And I got one more. And I hit that floor, that cement floor, with the back of my head and almost knocked a hole in that cement floor, but it knocked a hole in my head. Mm -hmm. If you really look closely, right there where my hand is, mm -hmm. you can even see the prints mm -hmm. of seven stitches. Mm -hmm. And if I ran outside with all the other children, the sun beamed down on my head, 
the stitches would burst and it started bleeding. I had to go back to the doctor. Mm. Circumstances that I put myself in, guess what? I learned something from that. What y'all think I learned? Mm -hmm. no so, Brown, what did I learn? Mm -hmm. I said I learned. I did learn. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing? What's the first lesson I got? Obey. Obey. Mm -hmm. You heard how she said that? Obey. Yeah. <laughs> you obey. Mm -hmm. The second thing I learned. When you say you're going to get your last one, that could be your last one. That, that, that was <laughs> and the third thing I learned, when I got the last one in and I didn't obey, I had to suffer for some three years behind it. Mm -hmm. Yep. The dad had taken off work. He wasn't happy about that. Every time the sun came out and the blood started flowing real good in my body, I'm playing baseball, blood started coming out of the stitches. Yeah. For about three years. What an awful way to lie. Mm -hmm. Sister Brown said I should have obeyed. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Sister David said, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you had to obey, you wouldn't have those stitches in the back of your head right now. The second paragraph, Brother Whitmark says, throughout scripture, God takes the initiative. The scripture, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good will. God is working in you. God is moving in you. It is, it is your place to see what God is. Throughout scripture, God takes the initiative. When it comes to people, he reveals himself and his activity. God is revealing himself to us and we just walk it past it. God is active in us and we just walk it past it. God is showing us something, he is initiating something and we just keep walking past it. When, when, oh human beings, will we learn and stop and listen to God? There, there are some times, and it happened several times to me, I, I'm rushing out the door, and then I said, well, let me stop and give God my quiet time. Stop, gave God my quiet time, got up, got on the road, and once I got on the road, I saw evidence of the accident that I could have been involved in had I not stopped to give God his quiet time. If I had been at that intersection at that particular time, and five cars got piled up, just the, the few minutes that I gave God made the difference. God is initiating things. God is trying things in our favor so that he can get the glory and his will and his purpose will be in our lives. When it comes to people, God has activities going on. When it comes to people, God has revelation going on. He's trying to give it to us. The revelation is always an invitation for people to make adjustments in their lives. When God gives us the invitation, when God gives us a revelation, when he revelates to us, he's saying, look, I want you to stop and I want you to understand that this revelation is an invitation for you to adjust your life. Mm -hmm. Adjust to God. Mm -hmm. But we want God to adjust to us. Yes, right. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. We want the holy God himself to make adjustments to our agenda. Now, God, this is what I'm going to do. That's why the senior saints would say, if it's the Lord's will. Number one, because the Bible says it. If it's the Lord's will, I'll see you in the morning. Brother Johnson, why y'all say that? If it's the Lord's will. Why would, why would y'all say this, if it's the Lord's will? Is there a reason y'all just saying that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Is his will. Because if it's not God's will, guess what? Mm -hmm. You won't see me in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I won't see you in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, Savarni, if it's not God's will, it doesn't matter how we plan. It doesn't matter what we do. If it's not God's will, let me tell you, it's not going to happen. God knows how to shut us down, doesn't he? God knows just what a week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good God, <laughs> my. 
my, my, my. God knows one inch could have been gone. Mm -hmm. But God knows mm -hmm. how to situate a bullet from the mouth just one inch. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, did God get the orange man's attention? Mm -hmm. For about two seconds he did. Mm -hmm. no, After two seconds was over, he raised, would somebody tell him this means black power? Would somebody tell him that? He thinks he's just part of this fist. Tell him in the 60s and 70s, this meant black power. Amen. Tell him to look at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. He, he thinks he's just raising his fist. But God, regardless of what we wish, regardless of what we thought, regardless of what we have prayed, one inch, but now, there's one inch to this direction. This one is would have ended it all. But God is showing us that He is in control. That's right. And He still is in control. And God is still giving us revelation. I mean, one revelation here as of this week is so that He can be running scared now. You get that when you get to the house. God allows circumstances. And God forbid, I might as well say, God forbid if a black woman, if a bullet can't take him out and a black woman take him out, he's going to jump off a bridge. Throughout scripture, God takes, takes the initiative. The, re the revelation is always an invitation for people to adjust their lives to God. None of the people God encountered could remain the same after they met God. Let me tell you, when you get to know God, you can't remain the same. When you get to experience God, you will not remain the same. And check this out. If he had an encounter with God, he wouldn't be talking about a bloodbath today. About a half a second. About a half a second he thought about God. Mm -hmm. That's it. These people who God encountered and, and encountered God, they had to make major adjustments and they had to walk obediently with him. Let me tell you, every time I look at a, a driveway now, every time I walk in, into a, a, a car porch, every time I walk into a car porch, guess what I think about? What do you think I think about? If I had been obedient, but my, if I just had not had to get that last one in, mm -hmm. I had gotten several in already before Mama said something. <laughs> but Mama said, don't y'all be sliding out there. Mm -hmm. I looked at my partners. I said, brother, I got to get that one more. Mm -hmm. And that one more mm -hmm. caused blood to flow from my head and stitches in my head for the last three years. Let me tell you. And then the doctor got so sick of me coming, I think he just put him in there the last time. Mm. Disobedience. Who has the next two um, paragraphs? God is the sovereign Lord. Strive to keep your life God-centered because he is the one who sets the agenda. He is always the one who takes the initiative to accomplish what he wants to do. When you are God-centered, even the desires to do the things that please him come from God's activity in your life. See Philippians 2.13, which reads, It is God who is working in you, both to will and to work, according to his good purpose. What often happens when we see God at work? We immediately become self-centered rather than God-centered. Mm -hmm. We must reorient our lives to God. We should learn to see things from his perspective. We need to allow him to develop his character in us. We must let him reveal his thoughts to us. Only then we can gain a proper perspective on life. Amen. But what does it mean when we say God is the sovereign God? God is the sovereign Lord. He's the sovereign God. It means that God knows what he's doing. God does what he wants to do. There is no one on planet Earth who is sovereign. That's right. Regardless of what he says. He says... I can save you without a silly cross. 
That tells me you may lift your eyes in hell. So he makes mockery. Men can make mockery of our Lord. But God is sovereign. The other thing about God, he never sleeps nor slumbers. He sees and he hears everything. He's the sovereign God. We must strive to keep our lives God-centered. We must strive to keep our lives God-centered because God sets the agenda. We ought to plan. We ought to make plans. We ought to look at our plans before we go to bed. We ought to pray over our plans. But at the end of the day, you may have an itinerary, but God sets the agenda. God sets it. Even as I looked at what I got planned for the day, somebody asked me, what's your plan? I said, well, I got to go look at it. And even after I look at it, God has the sovereign right to set my agenda. Have you ever thought of, have you ever started your day with all your stuff laid out and you got three things to do? And after you do these three things, you're going to relax. But by the time you start doing one, you got 10 more on your plate. And your whole day is going, and don't let somebody walk in the room. Because they can give you six things at a time. Preacher said today, he said that the men are waffles. Women are spaghetti. What he said is, when you look at a waffle, waffle, I'm not going to talk to Sister Brown tonight. Sister Wood, when you look at a waffle, <laughs> when you look at a waffle, it has compartments. Mm -hmm. And men are able to handle one compartment at a time. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to a woman, she's like a spaghetti. And when you pull one string of spaghetti out, it disturbs it disturbs 25 more on its way out. Yep. What he said was, if you come in the room and you're getting instructions from a woman, she will give you 10 instructions before she you get the first one done. Yes? Yep. And it would raise your hand if you would. <laughs> <laughs> and then she'll ask you, did you get this done? This done. Hey, baby, I'm trying to get the first one done. That blessed me so much because that let me know that I ain't the only one. Here I am trying to be a waffle. Trying to get this one done, then move to this one, and then move to this one. But here that spaghetti comes. And the spaghetti will always, the spaghetti will always disturb ten other ones. You can't pull just one spaghetti out. You're going to move ten, twenty, twenty-five others. And as I just said, you know, we used to say men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Or women from Venus, men are from Mars. Now we got a new one. Men are a waffle. <laughs> and, <laughs> and women are spaghetti. And they, 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 they boy, well, baby, I'm trying to get this one done. Now, what did you say? How many did you give me? God wants us to be God-centered. Our desires ought to be God-centered. God activities ought to be what we have be based on the fact that we set our, ten, uh, our itinerary to God's itinerary. And the only way you can do that is through prayer, through his word, and through circumstances. God is the one who sets the agenda. What often happens when we see God in we immediately become self-centered. And tonight we're talking about God at work and we don't like what God is doing. <laughs> Have you ever seen God at work and you don't like what God is doing? Or you don't like what God is not doing? Mm -hmm. The woman that we read about in the first paragraph, she, she has a miscarriage and, and she doesn't like what God is doing. But she remained God-centered after she got shaken up. Mm -hmm. She got back to being God-centered. Mm -hmm. You see, God is such an awesome God. He can handle your stuff, my stuff, and everybody else's stuff at the same time. And God is, this didn't sneak up on God. When you look at Mark chapter 4, the, the, the disciples are in the water and, and a, a, a storm comes up. Jesus walks up and says, peace be still. The wind and the waves laid down like a sleeping baby. 
Even the disciples said, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. God put the wind and the waves there so Jesus can teach them that they have to have faith. And Jesus says to them, go on over to the other side. He says, we are going to the other side. And whatever Jesus says, it's going to happen. He says, we're going to the other side. Now, because he says we're going to the other side, Sister Bernie, that means you're not going to have trouble getting there. I'm telling you, trouble shows up when you do it right. <laughs> because the disciples was obeying Jesus. They were, they were doing just what Jesus said. Have you ever done everything right and you know you're right and poof, there's trouble. That's trouble. You either in trouble, coming out of trouble, or headed for trouble. Trouble knows your Twitter account, your X account. Trouble knows your address. Trouble knows your phone number. Have you ever had a great day going and somebody makes a phone call and your phone rings, you pick it up and, and when you get off the phone, your whole countenance is different. Trouble. Yes. Trouble. <laughs> Trouble. Circumstances. We have to reorientate ourselves. Reorient ourselves. You know, most jobs have orientation. And then they have... Um, uh, workshops for the, those who are, are already employees to get reoriented. Mm -hmm. we, we have to understand God wants us to see things from his perspective, not just our human perspective. The only reason God is revealing to us is so we can see things from a God perspective. I think Sister Woods next, right? Top of page 39. God's revelation of his activity is an invitation for you to join him. If you keep your life God-centered, you will immediately join his activity. When we see God at work around us, your heart will leap within you and you will say, thank you, Father, for letting me be involved where you are. Yeah. Number one, write your own word how people become involved in God's work. B, which of the following are ways God may reveal his plan or his purpose? I need to read it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, one, let, he lets me see where he is already working around me. Two, he speaks to me through scripture and impresses on me a practical application of the truth to my life. Three, he gives me an honest desire that grows strongly as I pray. And number four, he creates circumstances around me that open doors of opportunity. Amen. So God's revelation of his activity is an invitation. It is an invitation. God is inviting us to join him. Whatever the activity may be, God is inviting us to join him. Whether it's a, a happy activity or unhappy activity, God is waiting and is looking and inviting us to join him where he's at work. But the only way we can do it is that we become God-centered. And the only way to become God-centered is in prayer and it's Bible study and in the midst of his circumstances. Let me tell you, there are a lot of things that happens in our lives that if they did not happen, we wouldn't be this far down the road. There are a lot of things. I, I had said years ago, I was 22 years old, I had said at 22, and I haven't done it yet, I'm going to write a book called Thank You, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Because when I went to Lewis Grocery Company, they said nobody else has a degree in electronics, nobody else has a maintenance degree, so when a position becomes available, we're going to just stick you in there. I was there for a year and a half, three positions became available in the same maintenance department. They brought in three guys from the outside that wasn't even hired and put them in the maintenance department. 
So, you know, I just asked the question. I went up upstairs to the manager's office. His name was Tom Patterson. This is 1984. I walked up to Mr. Tom Patterson's desk and said, sir, I need to ask you a question. He said, have a seat. And he, I, I asked him, I said, well, why wouldn't I consider for one of those positions? I went on to tell him that they promised me in HR that they would put me in a position. He said to me, all 380 pounds, leaning across the desk, he looks at me and he says to me, I hire who I want to, and I put them where I want them to be. I walked back downstairs, I said, thank you, sir. Walked back downstairs in 1984, canceled my vacation for 84, carried it over to 85, came to Houston, Texas one week, uh, talked to them about a job, they promised me a job, went back to, to Indianola, Mississippi, took all of my money out of the credit union, came back the next week and called them long distance that Thursday of next week and said, I quit. And then he tried to get upset with me. Oh, you gonna quit like that? Yeah, you wouldn't give me an opportunity. And just before my 3.30 shift at night, I called him, Say I'm done. I wanted to say thank you, Tom, because if it had not been for Mr. Tom, Tom Patterson, I never would have felt what it was like to make $20,000 a year. I never would have felt what it was like to make several other thousand dollars a year. I probably still would have been making $7.65 and I was making $7.16 then. <laughs> and it's been 39 years ago. So I came out here on a two-week vacation, started hanging out with Brother Miles, enjoyed hanging out with him so much. I came on 20, uh, a two-week vacation, and now it's been 39 years. And I'm still hanging out with him. Isn't he a great guy? <laughs> and I just want to say thank you, Mr. Tom Patterson, for putting me in a situation where I can get out of there. Because chances were, chances are that I never would have gotten out of there because I was looking forward to being an over-the-road truck driver because that was the biggest job going. Mm -hmm. I was loading trucks and as the, as the drivers came in, I would ask them about all the certifications for truck driver. And when I was bagging my little skid up to dump stuff in the doctor, I was beep, 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 beep. I was focusing on driving the truck. Mm -hmm. I would have been a truck driver for life. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Mr. Tom. <laughs> thank you for putting stuff in my way that forced me to get out of there. Yeah. Uh, no, that's right. And it's only because of God putting us in circumstances where we can be used by him and he can get the book. Let's look at this. Write in your own words how people become involved in God's work. How do people become involved in God's work? A few lessons back, we found out that you go and look for an opportunity to see what God is at work. Look for opportunities to get involved with what God is at work. Be one. Look for ways that God's revealed in his plan and his purpose. Be one. He lets me see where he is already working around me. I checked all four, all four of these. Number two, he speaks to me through scripture and impresses on me a practical application of truth to my life. Number three, he gives me an honest desire to grow stronger as I pray. Number four, he creates circumstances around me to open a door of opportunity. Okay, Sister Davis got the last one, but she addressed all four of these. It says, God always takes the initiative. He does not wait to see what we want to do for him. After he has taken the initiative to encounter us, he waits until we respond to him by making ourselves available to him. In question B, all four are ways God may reveal his plans to you. There are others as well. The last two, three and four, however, must be carefully watched. A self-centered life tends to confuse, confuse its selfish desire with God's will. In addition, circumstances do not always indicate a clear direction from God. Open and closed doors do not always indicate God's guidance. Check to see that prayer, the scriptures, and circumstances agree on the direction you sense God leading you. Amen. When we 
are God sent. We have to keep in mind that just because things go wrong doesn't mean that God is not in it. Just because things are not going right doesn't mean it's not a God. Mm -hmm. And the reverse is true. Just because things are going so well, just because you're in the right place in your life doesn't mean that God is in it either. Mm -hmm. Just because you're feeling good, just because your bank account is right, your full 1K, your full 3B, your retirement, all that, those things are in, right, in the right place doesn't mean that God is in it. Just like when churches flock and fill up, it doesn't mean that God is there filling up because of God. It doesn't mean that God is at work. We all want our churches to fill up. We all want this Holy Ghost filled atmosphere every Sunday. But there are some Sundays that you just have to lecture and talk to people. There are other Sundays you may be talking to five, but you ought to preach like you're talking to 500. What are some of the circumstances in your life? that you think God is operating in and you found out, you thought God was operating in and you found out that he was not. Anybody? 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 Who's talking? Who's talking? Yeah, pass it back there. Somebody gonna grab it. Somebody's scared the church is not just hot. <laughs> So we, we have to understand that just because things are going our way doesn't mean it's of God. And just because things are not going our way doesn't mean it's of God. You know, every single person, every single person who gets married, they will tell you in counseling and premarital counseling, they will tell you the day of the wedding, they will tell you this is God sent. God gave this woman to me. God gave this man to me. And that same couple will wake up the two weeks later and say, I married the wrong person. <laughs> Why do they do that? Because as long as the long flowing white road is walking in, people are standing up on every side. People are cheering them on, throwing rice on them, rose petals. It looks good. It feels good. We love it. But then when you get to the house, bills got to be paid. Floors got to be swept. Mm -hmm. Meals got to be served. Then I got to give up half of my money and you got to give up half of yours. Mm -hmm. Or I got to put my money with you and I don't even trust you. <laughs> Talking about love. <laughs> what love got to do with it? Okay, I make more money than you. I'm the one bringing stuff to the table. Now you just told me the Lord said for you to marry me. Not all circumstances are good when God is in it. Not all circumstances are bad when God is not in it. Look at Jesus. We call it Good Friday, but it was bad for Jesus. I always wonder, why do they call it Good Friday and Good Thursday when they beat him, they falsely accused him, they pulled plugs out of his skin, they hung him, they pierced him, he died, and we call it Good Friday. It's Good Friday because all of that represents our salvation. Jesus made it possible for us to live forever. The devil thought they had it. Every imp in hell thought they had it. But before Sunday morning, sun rose. He got up with all power. God was in it when they whipped him. God was in it when they lied on him. God was in it when they denied him. God was in it when they sold him out. God was in it when he was buried. And God was in it when he rose again. And for somebody here tonight, they need to know that God is in it. That Jesus died for you, he was buried for you, and he rose from the dead. Amen. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to try Jesus. The fact that he died for your sins, he was buried in a barred tomb, and he rose from the dead, he made it possible for you to go to heaven. 
to Jesus that day from, from a human point it was a bad day but for us it was a good day because Jesus died on Calvary and that Thursday morning that Sunday morning he got up with all power if you want to go to heaven if you want to meet Jesus if you want to live a fruitful abundant life on earth you need Jesus invite him into your life if this is you, just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried in a borrowed tomb. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come in my life to make me a new person. I thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you earnestly pray this prayer, you are now born again. You're on your way to heaven. And the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Please let us know if you receive Christ during this broadcast. We want to celebrate with you and glorify God on your behalf. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com lifting dot Jesus at yahoo.com if you want to mail in your gift you can mail it to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City Texas 77459 if you need an envelope in this place raise your hand and Sister Cora Woods will bring one for you because I know she brought one, but if you need one, she'll get you one. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God is such an awesome and such a great God. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father God, for who you are, for what you do. Lord, we pray for Evangelist Logan. We ask you to touch him, move in his life. We pray, Father God, that you bless his ministry. We pray, Father God, that he won't for nothing, that you will provide all things. We pray for Kimberly, Father God. We ask you to touch, provide a way out of no way. Minister to her, Father God. Bless their lives, that their lives will be in, in line with yours and what your will is. Lord, we ask you to bless them to make proper adjustments. 
that you, Lord, will be able to save, minister, and direct. Lord, we thank you for the New Beginning Church. We thank you for what you do through us. We ask you to bless us and continue to be a beacon light to dark and dismal world. We pray, Father God, that everybody that's under the sound of my voice, bless, Father God, heal, touch, deliver, and courage. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for you are God by yourself. You are sovereign. We come asking you to show yourself mighty. We pray, Father God, that you use us, that we will reach people for you. In the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of our Bible study, and in the midst, Father God, of our prayers, speak to us, tell us, show us, reveal unto us. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Our mission and vision. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto you. John 12 and 32. We are, you are dismissed.